Some of you may know, and some may not, that uh, the writer of that song, The Gospel is for All, Brother McCaleb, was one of the early travelers across the seas who spent his life in Japan in the late 19th century, early 20th century, preaching the gospel. And thus he wrote that song. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, in chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, saying, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Thus, this morning, in the light of that text, remember, written to Christians, our brethren of almost 2,000 years ago, wrote about the power of the resurrection. He's not speaking of Jesus being raised from the dead. He's speaking about Christians being raised from the dead and personally himself being raised from the dead. So the sermon has to do with to be raised from the dead, to die no more, the power of the resurrection. Concerning this text, Philippians 3, 10 through 11, it is quite obvious from what we know elsewhere in the New Testament about Paul that he was willing to sacrifice anything and all things even his own life, to, as he says, attain unto the resurrection of the dead. You'll notice as you read through the Philippian epistle and you take note of all of what the Scripture says in the New Testament about the Apostle Paul and his love for the Lord, his faith in the Lord, his service to the Lord, that he counted all things for loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of of Jesus Christ. This should remind us who have heard the same gospel, who have believed it, who have in the process of complying with the terms of pardon and the great plan of salvation of the gospel, repented of our sins, confessed our faith in Christ, and have been baptized into Christ for the remission of past sins, to find great encouragement in this. It is too easy for us to think of things strictly as in this life. And yet the Bible is full of material emphasizing to the child of God the importance of the power of the resurrection in aiding us to be faithful to the Lord in His church. Notice he wanted to know the power of the resurrection. And notice what he says. And this is what we need in our minds and in our lives. If by any means, any means, he could attain to the resurrection. And of course he means the resurrection of life. You remember that the Apostle John says, We do not know what we should, shall be like, but we shall be like him when we see him as he is. Well, of course, that does not mean that we become God. You don't become God. It means that we will enjoy the same glorified body as the resurrected Lord. Now, frankly, that is completely beyond my mind to comprehend. The whole state of existence beyond living in the flesh, I believe it because I know the Bible is the Word of God and God does not lie. But to comprehend it? No, you would have to experience it. Well, none of us here have done that. No man walking on this earth has done that. I think it's interesting that when you read of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, that there must have been people who came to him knowing human <laughs> curiosity and said, what was it like? There's no indication that when he came back into the flesh like we are now and as he was before his death, that there was anything in his mind about 
the Hadean world where his spirit went while he was dead. So there's nobody that can tell us about what it's like to experience even the process of death when the spirit leaves the body. James says the body apart from the spirit is dead. Best definition of death you're going to get. Doesn't mean it's annihilated. It doesn't mean it goes unconscious. It just means that when this physical house no longer can function biologically, then the spirit leaves. Rider, the Old Testament said the spirit returns to God who gave it. We have to read in the New Testament more material, such as Luke 16, to know where the spirits of dead men go. But Paul looks beyond that. If you read 1 Corinthians, you'll see that. Read 2 Corinthians 5, you'll see it. He looks beyond the time of the separation of the spirit from the body and the spirit in the Hadean world where Jesus went, the time he was dead, and where Lazarus was, as Jesus pictured it in Luke 16. He looks to the time of the reuniting of his person, his inner man, his spirit, with the body. But it won't be like this body. People sometimes raise the question, how will we look? <laughs> I don't know. Let me add one thing to that. I don't care. I think just exactly like Paul says here, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. That'll all be taken care of. Because we're going to understand and see and comprehend and grasp things in ways that are far, far beyond us even our ability in this life to understand. Notice Paul dealt with that concerning what it meant for him to attain, for him to attain in the resurrection of the dead, if by any means he could do so. Paul wrote to the church in Rome, a most familiar passage to all of us, exhorting faithful compliance with the Lord's will. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Notice he says, I beseech you, I really regret that the word beseech is not used in modern English like it once was. It may be used sometimes, but not like it was. Beseech is where I am imploring you. I'm begging you. With all that I have within me and by the mercies of God Almighty in Christ, I'm begging of you to hear this message and give attention to it and understand it. So as Paul, by the Spirit, writes part of the New Testament of Christ, he's pictured here in his own words, the Spirit guided him to say, I beg you, I'm on bended knee, pleading with you. In the light of what I've just said, I beseech you, therefore, and that's what therefore means, in the light of the reasoning I've been doing with you, the teaching I've been doing preceding this verse, by the mercies of God. You know why we still walk as we do now in the flesh? It's by the mercy of God. Remember what Peter said, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, speaking of the second coming of Christ. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So I'm glad time goes on. And I pray that people who are unfaithful or outside of Christ will utilize the time that they yet have because no man knows when it's going to end to learn the truth of the Lord and comply with God's will because there's a day coming when that time will cease for us. So when people are in conditions of being unfaithful to the Lord, I pray that their life will be preserved, that they will come to a knowledge of the truth about themselves, that they will be repentant. The Lord's not slack concerning His promise as some men count slackness. He's talking about His promise to return at the time we'll receive that resurrected body like His. As some men count slackness, men have a terrible time of not thinking of God as they think of themselves. But he's long-suffering to us. He does not want anyone to perish. You can think of the most wicked people in the world. He doesn't want them to perish. 
but that all should come to repentance. But that power is within me. I, I must repent. I must will to turn against an habitual purpose life of sin or any one sin and embrace the truth of God in all things in my life. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as living sacrifices. Now, that's what Paul's talking about when he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. In other words, I'm willing to undergo the same death he did for the same reason that Christians die, even if it means dying like he did. Tradition, and I'll underscore the word tradition, has it that as Peter was crucified, he would not allow himself to be crucified upright for that was too good for him, for that was the way the Lord was crucified. So he demanded to be crucified upside down. Well, whether that's true or not, the principle taught here certainly indicates the desire that if it takes it, I will conform to the death of Christ if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Present your bodies as living sacrifices. Under the Old Testament, they offer dead sacrifices. But we offer living sacrifices. When we were baptized, we were baptized to his death. The old man was buried. We rise to walk from the waters of baptism in newness of life. New creatures in Christ. Our whole attitudes change. That's what conversion means. He says that living sacrifice which we are once we become Christians is holy acceptable unto God I think about that don't you want to be acceptable to God Paul tells you how he says that's your reasonable service in other words if God has done all these things for us we never could do for ourselves but he made us free moral agents with power to choose the truth or reject it then once you've chosen the truth obeyed it become a Christian then it's reasonable that you dedicate your life in view of what God's done for us through Christ in service to Him. Thus, what does that mean? Be not conformed to this world. It was mentioned already, and we've had it running out our ears in the last week or so, of all the troubles in the land. Well, that's just recent troubles. I've, I've lived long enough to reflect way back to see that same kind of demonstrations and people out in the streets burning things down. All of it's supposed to be, that's a good thing. There's nothing good about that. Nothing good about it at all. We're not to be conformed to this world. That's the way the world thinks. It operates on the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. So we're not to be conformed to this world. Well, then what are we to be? We're to be transformed. How can I be transformed? By the renewing of my mind. How do I renew my mind? I quit concentrating on the here and now and the things of this life as if this is all there is. And I concentrate on the truth of God as to the design and purpose of this life in the flesh, which is to get ready for eternity. Life's a vapor, James says, and appears for a little while and vanishes away. So we renew our minds with the truth of God's Word. And that... He says, you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. I just don't know what's right except that I know God's will. I'm God's creature. He made me. He knows how to lead me and guide me for me to use this life as he intended to prepare for eternity. But you know, everything I've just said is meaningless without the resurrection. Paul reasons in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if only we have hope in Christ Jesus, then we're of all men most miserable. What does he mean? If Christ be not raised from the dead, if there is no resurrection. And only because Christ was raised from the dead did not no more do we have hope and expectation, if you please, of being raised also. That's why John wrote what he wrote when he says we don't know what we will be like, but we will be like him. So there's power in the resurrection, power that can influence us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know our labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15. What's the most powerful thing that you can think of? 
Is it a nuclear weapon? Well, that's pretty powerful. Is it something like a black hole in outer space, if you've read a little bit about that? No, it, it shouldn't be thought of that way. Is it the creative force of man? Look what all man has done. And he has. He's done tremendous things. Well, let me tell you what is the most powerful. When you can walk out of your own grave, that's what's the most powerful. And when you think of Christ rising from the dead, he blazed the trail for everyone who will be faithful to him, who live their lives as living sacrifices. He has promised he will raise us from the dead. So when we live our lives as if right now in the flesh and everything around us is all there is, and there is no God, there's no eternity, everything's secular and material, then no wonder that people live the way they live. But we who have heard from the heart obeyed the gospel, who are new creatures in Christ, who have our hopes and our desires set on things above, who look forward to being in that resurrected, glorified body to die no more. Let the ages roll, whatever it will be like after this material system is gone. We will be there in pristine glory and bodies like the Lord presently has. So to be in the image of Christ's resurrection is to experience the power of change. You think of the lame man there in Acts at the beautiful gate that Peter and John came up to. What a change that was for him. Never walked and he's expecting somebody to give him money. And yet Peter says, silver and gold have I none, such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Luke says, being the physician that he was, his ankle bones received strength, so we know where his problem was, his ankle bones. And he arose. Why is that in your Bible? What do you learn from that about you and your service to God and your faithfulness to him? Well, it should give you strength to trust God in all things. Every one of the miracles Christ did, the apostles did. In Acts 3, 26, Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That's Peter's second sermon after Acts 2. Now the question I need to ask is, are there things in my life or your life that you wish to change? Well, there's power in the change that Christ offers because he offers you eternal life in the resurrection. You can walk out of your grave by the power of the living God. Now, how many people have that hope? The power of the resurrection is the power of victory. Everybody's trying to be victorious over something. Victorious over illnesses, victorious over whatever. It doesn't make any difference. They're trying to gain the victory. It is said of Alexander the Great that he wept because there were no more lands to conquer. But you know, there's no power in human victory. That again is a mind wedded to this world. When you look at the communists of Russia, present day communist China, and the communist among us. They think of religion, and this is the way they refer to it, is the opiate of the people. It deludes the people. They simply look at it as something that is a figment of man's imagination. I hope in the future, it's a little lengthy, so I don't know how I'm have to divide it up to sermons. To preach a sermon, I used to preach 40-something years ago during the Cold War, about communism. Seems to me it needs to be preached again now as much as ever. Because it offers only this world. And they spoke of heaven is the pie in the sky by and by and laugh at you. They want it now. But here's what's amazing about them. 
they're willing to die thinking they go into oblivion and cease to exist for the next generation to do better and the next generation to do better from what their concept of being better is without any hope of everlasting life. And we need to, with hope of everlasting life, to realize that's why we need to be faithful and mindful the gospel is for all and the church needs to be kept faithful and every one of us needs to understand the will of God for our lives as faithful children of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, that great chapter where Paul's correcting misconceptions of the church of Corinth concerning the resurrection, he writes in verses 54 through 57, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption. You know, some of us who are older and even some who are younger, we talk about how our bodies are dilapidating. <laughs> how they're wearing out. And I like verses like this. I always have, even when I first preached it as a very young preacher. When this corruptible shall have put on incorruption. And this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Remember what we said about victory? O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But now watch him. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, ask yourself the question, why is that in the Bible, and what did he intend me to get out of it when I read it? To make me a better person. Why do I let, you know, some people, let put it this way. Some people, and I've never seen the time in all my preaching career or any other preacher, that you didn't have to preach to people who obeyed the gospel, at least their outer, outside appearances they did. And you're constantly reminding them just to, to worship, just to come with the saints to worship. What does that say about their understanding of life in the flesh now and how they prepare for eternal life? It says they're more like the world than they are like God intends the church to be. I want a victorious death. There's no reason for someone not to have a victorious death. All means and Ways of it happening have been set out in Christ by his gospel. The power of God unto salvation, Romans 1 16. So there's power in the victory that Christ offers. And we sing a song sometimes, there's power in the blood. Then there's power of the resurrection in the hope that it offers. Now, according to scientists, this uh, universe is expanding out of control. There's no power in this hope because if you just let time continue, if God just says, I'll let it all play out, I don't know how many years that would be into the future. But at some point in the future, even atheistic scientists acting not on theories but on science will say it's all going to come to an end. Well, there's no hope in there. It is thought, because John the Apostle did live to a great age, even now, but certainly then, it's thought that he was roughly 95 years old when he died. But you won't find him writing anything if he did live to be 95 or 90 or 85. Anything any different pertaining to how you use this life and what there is beyond this life of the faithful child of God that he wrote when he was 35 or that he believed at least when he was 35. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 is where we've been referring to several times already. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. I'm glad you can know that. I can say I am through faith and obedience to the gospel a son of God. 
John says that. And he says, now it doesn't appear what we shall be. Here's what we've been referring to in the rest of the verse. But we know that. I like those wor that word no. That's solid. You could plant your feet on that. It's not going to move. But we know that when, we shall, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Does that not give any enthusiasm to anybody? Does it not lift up the spirits of all those who wear the name of Jesus, Christian, which means of Christ? Do we think when we die faithful that we're no longer of Christ? Certainly not. For we shall see him as he is. Do you want to live with Christ eternally? Do you want to be like him? Well, then there's power in the hope that Christ offers. The power of the resurrection of, Je of our resurrection because of the resurrection of Christ is the power of salvation. The great messianic prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 64, 6, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness is as filthy rags. You cannot merit your salvation. You can't do all of these things and on the basis of your having done them, say, I have earned heaven. That's not the way it works. You cannot earn heaven. You can be rewarded for your faithfulness to the truth, but that's not having to do with meritorious acts on your part. Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, I ask you, where is the power to make things new? Where is the power of salvation? When we're baptized into Christ, our old sins are remitted. We contact the blood and the watery grave of baptism, for we are baptized into his death, Romans 6, 3 and 4. We're raised to walk in the newness of life because we're clean. Now, what keeps us clean? Well, I've quoted many times, 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. It keeps on cleansing as we faithfully follow Christ. We are new creatures and we're kept by the power of God. Romans 6, 3, and 5 goes back over this. I've been mentioning part of it. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we're buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, most of the time we quote it up to there emphasizing baptism is a burial and you're not saved till you're baptized, etc. But he, he says this is the end of this sentence. We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. You realize that's saying what John says we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Then Paul said the Colossians in Colossians 2.12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Remove the resurrection of Christ, and what is there to Christianity? You couldn't even obey the gospel, because it's in the likeness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. There would be no gospel, good news. It would be nothing but eternal torment in the hands of a just God. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. Christ came to buy us back from that. Christ came as a man to be tempted in every point like as we are, as the writer of Hebrews said, yet without sin. Christ came to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Christ came to die on the cross of Calvary. An innocent, sinless human being willing 
to submit to all those injustices. By the way, let me put this here. People talk about justice and injustice and how you deal with injustice. The greatest injustice ever experienced on this earth or ever could be was the injustice experienced by the Son of the living God. He was sinless. And yet he was condemned, even though he was. And he extends salvation even to those that condemned him. He set out before us that you do not correct injustices, though they are injustices. You do not correct injustices by being unjust yourself. All you have to do is note what we've said this morning and especially the whole New Testament on godly living. And you'll see that's just not the case. At the time when there was nothing like what we know in this nation because of the Constitution and the rights that are in it and the laws that are made must be or should be in harmony with that Constitution. Nobody knew about any of those things and nobody experienced them when Paul wrote the Roman epistle. But all these things were said by Jesus about justice and about civil governments. You read what Paul wrote in Romans 12 about the obligation the faithful child of the living God has toward government and then you go read about that government. So we must understand that in this life there's all kinds of injustices. If you're in a position to correct them properly, that's wonderful. I'm not saying we should let those things go when we have them here and just let people take them away from us. But I am saying that we live on a plane as a faithful child of God in the kingdom of heaven under our King Jesus that directs us how to live here because we know the design and purpose of life in the flesh. Do you think that Paul would have been what he was and what we read about him here? If he let the injustices committed against him stop him from doing what God said. And again, I'll just simply say, no one has experienced the injustice that Jesus Christ of Nazareth experienced. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Read Isaiah 53. And it speaks of nothing but injustice. Some 700 years before Christ wrote this earth. It predicts all of that. So we cannot, as members of the church, get to the point where we think all of our hope is in this life. All of our expectation is in this life. No, Christ taught us and the early church lived under a situation so unlike ours. We must be as they were, for they were as Christ taught. We've studied today about the resurrection, and the power of the resurrection, and the process. We studied how to become a Christian. We've studied about the obligation that we have to be righteous no matter what anybody else does or does not do. We've seen how that looking forward... Romans 8, 24, to the resurrection, like Christ now has a body at that time, so shall we, as a great encouragement. And that's the way we ought to think of it. If you can think of a better way to think of it, will you come and tell me? You can't think of it any better. The people who are crying out in false religions, their attitude toward government, etc., etc., who anchor you to the here and now and you can't see beyond today? Everything in your mind will always be as it is now? What hope is there in that? What encouragement is there in that? Someone says, well, I'd like to live a thousand years. 
it'd be the same old thing over and over. It'd be the same stuff. Fighting, killing, lying, cheating, murdering. You'd still have to resist on the basis of the truth of God's gospel. Because this life is a proving ground. And we must remember that. So the resurrection is the power of change, the power of victory, the power of hope, the power of salvation. Now, do you need to obey the gospel today in the light of those truths? Or as a child of God, have you been faithful as you ought? We know what to do to become a Christian if we study with us this morning. As a child of God, if you sin, we urge you to repent. Come confessing those sins and pray God for forgiveness. If you're subject then to the great invitation of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.